Who are the people who pretend to be rich but are actually broke? Let's get started with... Number 5. Elijah Oyefeso Elijah Oyefeso, a self-proclaimed millionaire, captivated both the financial world and the tabloids. It all started when Oyefeso found himself entangled in a heated dispute with a creditor, Dennis Ofosu. Desperate to settle the debt, Elijah attempted to give Ofosu his Toyota Prius by crashing it into Dennis and throwing him onto the hood. Oyefeso had a history of run-ins with authorities, including multiple convictions for driving offenses and possessing a weapon in a public place. Despite his self-proclaimed millionaire status, Elijah seemed to be no stranger to trouble. But it was Oyefeso's lifestyle that truly captured the public's attention. He showed off his supposed wealth on social media, bragging about his fleet of cars and jet-setting adventures. His Instagram feed showcased a dazzling array of opulence, from gold Lamborghinis and Rolls Royces to a Bentley Continental. In one video, Oyefeso purchased a luxurious 230,000 pound Rolls Royce for his mother, arriving at the dealership in a bathrobe. Another video showcases his six bedroom home in Chilworth, valued at over 1 million pounds. The video, presented in the style of the MTV show Cribs, concluded with Elijah embarking on a quest for a private jet. He visited an airfield, striking a pose on the hood of his Rolls Royce with a private jet in the background. Elijah even appeared on the TV show Rich Kids Go Shopping, where he demonstrated his ability to make 1,000 pounds in just 15 minutes through online trading. However, there were doubts about Oyefeso's actual financial standing. Despite his claims of immense wealth, his ongoing legal troubles and debt problems suggested a different reality. It became increasingly clear that his lifestyle might have been more smoke and mirrors than genuine prosperity. That thing he did earlier with his Prius, arguably most likely the worst thing ever done with the Prius, only added fuel to the fire. Elijah's violent outburst further tarnished his reputation and raised questions about his character, exposing a man willing to resort to ecologically friendly, violent behavior. Oyefeso claims that he achieved great wealth through his trading ventures. He insists that he started his company, DCT, short for dreams come true, with a student loan after dropping out of college and had mastered binary trading, making tons of money in the process. However, skeptics question his claims, pointing to the inconsistencies in his extravagant lifestyle and his recurring legal troubles. Ultimately, Oyefeso's reckless actions caught up with him. He was sentenced to two and a half years in prison for dangerous driving and weapons possession, and also banned from driving for over three years. Number four, Fred Castleberry. Fred Castleberry is a New York suit designer known for his upper-class image on Instagram, flaunting expensive suits and handmade loafers to his 80,000 followers. Castleberry found himself in trouble when he was jailed in Texas for skipping court over an eye-popping $390,000 in unpaid child support. His ex-wife's lawyer claimed that Castleberry's financial contributions were about as consistent as a gust of wind, with payments becoming more sporadic as time went on. Castleberry's brand motto, the better you dress, the worse you can behave clashes starkly with the reality of his personal life, where he dressed well but got in huge trouble. This dapper designer, once a part of the esteemed Ralph Lauren empire and a star on HBO Max's Stylish with Jenna Lyons, now finds himself caught in a whirlwind of controversy. Before Castleberry appeared in New York, he was a wedding photographer in the Fort Worth area of Texas. Back then, he fulfilled his financial obligations, making regular child support payments to his ex-wife, Bethany Richardson. But then, he packed his bags and headed east. As Fred Starr rose in the Big Apple, Richardson barely scraped by financially. Her children shared a bedroom and slept on pallets on the floor. It was a far cry from the glamorous life Castleberry portrayed on social media. The difference between his extravagant lifestyle and Richardson's plight is disgusting, and Castleberry's financial woes extend far beyond his unpaid child support. Despite his apparent wealth, public records reveal a laundry list of debts and legal problems. Tax liens, judgments, and outstanding balances loomed over him like like a storm cloud. Barclays Bank, George Malafis, the IRS, and the state of New York all eagerly await their due. Despite being ordered by a Texas judge to appear in court, Fred pulled a disappearing act and vanished in a thin air. Frustrated by his absence, the judge issued an arrest warrant for the impeccably dressed fugitive. Castleberry's family, determined to see him walk free, rallied the troops and launched a GoFundMe campaign with a heartfelt plea, Free Frederick. Somehow, donations poured in, allowing Castleberry to get out of jail. However, there was a catch. A lump 
sum of $50,000 had to be paid to Richardson first. After his release, Fred was put on a payment program and given nine years probation. And really, how in the world did this guy get donations on GoFundMe? Did people hear the plight of a man who didn't want to support his children to the tune of $390,000 and thought, well, he deserves my dollar, I'll help, I need those loafers. Number three, Sarah King. Sarah Jacqueline King is a Los Angeles-based lawyer who used her company, King Lending, to fabricate loan applications so she could take loans from a third-party lender. But here's the twist. She had no intention of paying them back. LDR International Limited, based in the British Virgin Islands, fell victim to King's false promises, and between January and October 2022, she managed to secure 97 loans from LDR. To legitimize her fraudulent activities, King claimed she had collateral in the form of cars, yachts, jewelry, and money from sports contracts, but these assets were never actually put up. In an attempt to enhance her credibility, King went to great lengths to associate herself with well-known sports stars and politicians. Through carefully orchestrated encounters and photo opportunities, she captured moments with these individuals intended to mislead potential investors. Among the athletes she managed to befriend were Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, Patrick Mahomes, and Josh Allen. King didn't shy away from the political arena either, and she managed to get close to former Vice President Mike Pence and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. She sent the images to LDR, portraying herself as a successful and influential figure in the industry. Sarah embarked on a lifestyle of indulgence, squandering other people's money on a gambling trip in Las Vegas. Estimates suggest that King amassed an astonishing sum of $11 million and took up residence in the renowned Wynn Las Vegas Resort and Hotel, where she lived for six months and engaged in round-the-clock gambling. Sarah also faced a slew of other lawsuits from individuals and companies. George Poole an investor, claims he never received repayment of a $125,000 investment made to her. Another lawsuit stems from King's release of a Rolls-Royce Dawn in 2019. A financial company alleged that King owed them 300000 bucks. To make matters worse, she tampered with the car's odometer, violating state and federal laws and diminishing its value. King's first husband also joined the legal fray, accusing her of forging his signature and taking a $250,000 loan on their Newport Beach home. A notice of default was recorded against their $3 million property, with the loan remaining unpaid. And what about the money? Well, every cent she received from LDR International disappeared into thin air. Her ex-husband, who fled to Morocco, spilled the beans, confirming the massive fraud she had perpetrated. The once powerful queen of deception now finds herself clutching at straws with a measly $11.98 left to her name. And yet, somehow, she's still out there, spending other people's money. For a deeper dive into Sarah's story, which has even more more insanity we left out, click the link right here. Number two, John Spano. John Spano rose to infamy for his attempt to purchase the New York Islanders hockey team, a plan that would eventually lead to criminal charges. Spano's association with Mario Lemieux, a hockey star and owner of the Pittsburgh Penguins, added an air of credibility to his persona. Their friendship, combined with Spano's smooth talk, made him an intriguing figure in the sports world. Before setting his sights on the Islanders, Spano tried to buy the Dallas Stars. Negotiations between Spano and the Stars' owner ultimately fell apart due to Spano's inability to secure the money. Spano then tried to buy the Florida Panthers, but the owner decided to keep his shares. Undeterred by this setback, Spano shifted his focus to the struggling Islanders franchise. The Islanders were facing a myriad of issues, both on and off the ice. Financial troubles plagued the team, and their performance on the rink had been lackluster in recent years. Owner John Pickett had been looking for a buyer, and Spano saw an opportunity to make a name for himself and approach Pickett with an offer. As rumors of Spano's interest in the Islanders circulated, excitement grew among fans and the media. Spano capitalized on the buzz by holding press conferences, donning an Islanders jersey, presenting himself as the long-awaited savior of the team. However, behind the scenes, the deal was far from done, and Spano was engaging in an elaborate charade. Spano claimed that his funding would be paid by a trust fund from his uncle Angelo, worth a staggering $230 million. He produced letters from reputable banks and a Dallas attorney, all confirming the existence of the trust. This appeared more than enough to cover the $100 
$165 million cost of acquiring the Islanders. While negotiations continued, Spano lived a life of extravagance on the franchise's dime. He sat in box seats at games and talked with celebrities and influential figures. Limousines and private jets became his regular mode of transportation as he treated friends to lavish outings, all funded by the Islanders. However, as the process of securing a loan for the team purchase unfolded, Spano's deception began to unravel. His initial check to John Pickett for $17 million bounced, leaving Pickett furious and suspicious of Spano. Subsequent attempts at wire transfers encountered errors, with missing decimal points and incorrect amounts. Suspicions surrounding Spano prompted an investigation by the National Hockey League, which enlisted the help of a former FBI investigator. He revealed that Spano had concocted an elaborate scam and discovered that he had no wealthy uncle or trust fund to back his claims. Many of the documents provided by Spano were revealed to be fake, and the individuals who wrote the letters confessed to being bribed. Federal investigators had gathered enough evidence to charge Spano with multiple counts of wire fraud, but when they arrived at his Dallas mansion, he was nowhere to be found. Spano had fled to the Cayman Islands, claiming to withdraw money to repay his debts. When he realized his arrest was inevitable, since there was no money to withdraw, Spano returned to Long Island. Spano faced a long list of charges related to his financial crimes. The court ordered him to repay the millions he had spent using team funds and the money borrowed from individuals like Mario Lemieux, amounting to a staggering $12 million. Eventually, Spano pleaded guilty to four counts of fraud, striking a plea that resulted in a six-year prison sentence reduced in exchange for his cooperation. After his release in 2004, he found himself back in legal trouble just nine months later, this time for offering to secure a loan for a fee without actually delivering. He was sentenced to four years in prison. After that, Spano was once again caught defrauding a company called First Healthline. This time, the judge showed no leniency and Spano received 10 years. Why keep defrauding after repeatedly getting caught? Maybe he just really likes prison food. If you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay tuned right here for our past release to find out about how this guy pretended to be a high roller in Vegas knowing Drake. Number one, the other Sam Cooke. Sam Cooke gained notoriety for his scam that conned victims out of 110,000 pounds by creating an illusion of wealth and success to lure in investors. Cooke boasted to his parents as friends and business associates about turning a meager 2,000 pound investment into a staggering 21 million pounds, an enticing prospect for those seeking lucrative opportunities. However, instead of making legitimate investments, Cooke shamelessly pocketed their money and used it to fund a lavish lifestyle. From a luxurious apartment to extreme extravagant vacations, and even owning a Ferrari, Sam reveled in a life built on lies. Cook's mo was to present himself as a successful investor, promising lucrative returns to his clients. Using his parents' connections, he gained the trust of friends and associates who had no reason to doubt his assurances. By exploiting these relationships, Sam manipulated individuals into investing their life savings, leaving them financially devastated and emotionally betrayed. In an interview, Cook attempted to cement his status as a self-made millionaire he explained how he turned a small 2,000 pound loan from his father into an astonishing 21 million pound fortune. Cook painted himself as a financial prodigy, claiming that his wealth came from astute investments and remarkable success in the stock market. But the true extent of Sam's deception came to light when detectives, after reading the interview in a local newspaper, discovered that his Ferrari F430 Scuderia was nothing more than a well-made 20,000 pound replica of Ferrari. The officer investigated further and and discovered that the teenager's ostentatious lifestyle was all built on lies. Police identified at least six victims who had invested a total of 110,000 pounds under the false pretense of legitimate financial investments. This led to Cook's eventual admission of guilt on six counts of fraud. Cook said he was sorry, but his claims of remorse fell on deaf ears as the judge presiding over the case was shown a photograph of Sam and his father mockingly dressed as a judge and a police officer on Facebook. Cook's father, who was also in the photograph added another layer of complexity to the case, raising questions about the extent of his knowledge of his son's activities. The presence of Sam's father in the picture suggested a deeper involvement in the scheme, although his exact role is unclear. During the court proceedings, Cook claimed that he wasn't responsible for the props and was unaware of the photograph being shared online. However, such a feeble attempt to shift blame only further undermined his credibility and demonstrated a lack of personal accountability. In an attempt to make amends, Sam's father took steps to try and repay the money owed to the victims, but it was too late. As a consequence of his fraudulent activities, Cook was sentenced to more than two years in prison, showing how much a pitcher can be worth. 
If gambling were easy, everyone would do it. If people won as often as Rob Gorodetsky, the self-proclaimed gambler, then it would not be gambling, would it? Rob Gorodetsky became a multi-millionaire Instagram celebrity and professional gambler in just a few short years. He played poker with celebrities such as NBA player Russell Westbrook, and he was friends with NFL players such as Odell Beckham Jr. He was even known to give Drake advice on what games to bet on. Except not everything was what it seemed. As with a lot of things in Vegas, Rob's life seemed to be another giant illusion for anyone who was really looking. Rob Gorodetsky's life of high fashion, high rolling, and higher gambling kept growing. So how did Gorodetsky, or Big Rob as he called himself, have the lifestyle he has? Was the money he made because of sheer luck or sheer skill? Or was it something else completely? Big Rob got his gambling start on the middle school playground when he was 13. He'd act as a bookie and take on bets with his classmates. He'd also organize poker games. But as expected from any good gambling story, he got himself suspended for it. Teachers at his school learned that students were losing a bunch of money and it was all going in Big Rob's pockets. When he wasn't running his gambling hall in high school, Rob was at his desk trading stocks on his dad's Ameritrade account. According to Rob and his parents, he made tens of thousands of dollars. His dad claimed that he made up to a half million dollars in high school alone in trading. Does anything sound fishy yet? Despite being smart enough to make a half a million dollars throughout high school, Rob decided to go to college anyways at the University of Arizona. However, Big Rob didn't last long. In fact, he didn't even make it through his first semester. He dropped out despite his parents' objections and he played online poker full time. Within three years, he built up a $90,000 bankroll. As soon as he turned 21, he headed off to Vegas to run up his bankroll. But when he got to Vegas, he moved away from poker and he began betting on sports. That was also around the time that he began playing blackjack and also tested his luck at the roulette table. And his betting started paying off big time. According to Rob, anyways, as documented on his now defunct Instagram account, Rob steadily posted winning tickets that just grew bigger and bigger. The pictures of the payouts steadily climbed from $10,000 to $100,000 and more. So how exactly did Rob do it? Rob's reputation grew so big that in 2017, he gave USA Today a tell-all story about his life. The headline of the article was called, Is This the Future of Sports Gambling? However, in the entire USA Today article, Rob really didn't explain anything to the methods of how he picked his bets. He essentially just talked about how much he did not know while showcasing his lifestyle. For example, on a college football game that he bet a hundred grand on, he told USA Today that he didn't know any of the players, yet he still bet on them anyways. Was he just trying to brag to USA Today to how much he didn't know? Was this a way for him to tell them what was really going on? He also told them that he bet as much as $150,000 per day on NBA Summer League games that year. According to Rob, he basically took his knowledge and his gut instinct and then bet big. He then went on to say how other big gamblers would do it. He talked about the age-old common practice of high rollers bribing what Rob called, quote, inner city college kids in order to shave points. Rob claimed that 10 grand to these inner city college kids would be like a million dollars to them. And he couldn't see how the inner city kids wouldn't do this point shaving. Yes, this guy seriously said this back in 2017, not that long ago. But of course, Rob never needed to do anything like that. That's because his gut feeling won him roughly 60 to 65% of his bets. He didn't need analytics or cheating to make his money. Renowned sports better Steve Fezzik was a skeptic. According to him, if a gambler starts with 1,000 bucks and bets 10% of his total money a day, a 60% win rate at the end of five years will get that gambler a billion dollars. Physics states that an all-star winning percentage is 55%. And those gamblers with that kind of winning percentage know everything about the players and the injury updates and 
just any news. They know everything about the game and the players, and they aren't just going on gut instinct. Despite everything on paper not making sense, Gorodetsky lived it up. His trademark piece was his hat with the word gambler stitched into it. If you've ever watched the HBO show Entourage, then you have a rough idea of who Rob rolled around with, and he documented it all on Instagram. If the women, money, and the betting slips he posted weren't enough to prove how cool he was, the celebrity pitcher should, such as Rob's pick with Cleveland Browns wide receiver Odell Beckham Jr. Rob supposedly had met him through OBJ's cousin, whom Rob had already knew. They met in the High Rollers Lounge in Aria, and they soon were playing at the blackjack table together. Rob supposedly lent OBJ 10 grand to play blackjack because he didn't have the cash on him. OBJ was apparently interested in having Rob put down 20,000 on a game for him, something that fell through. Do we need to say Beckham's representative claimed that OBJ doesn't know Rob and that the picture was only taken because of a simple fan request? OBJ wasn't the only supposed big name celebrity on his friends list. Rob also claimed to be Drake's gambling guru. He said that Drake once wired him $100,000 to bet on sports games. They had met in the same high rollers lounge in Aria one fateful Vegas night. Supposedly, Drake would bet through Rob for months. Reps for Drake didn't have any comment for Rob's claim. But it's the same story for Rob and celebrities. He knows someone with a name, and Rob claimed that they would bet through him. Each time, the celebrity or their rep would deny knowing Rob or just didn't have any comments. USA Today wasn't completely enamored by Rob. They mentioned a judgment against him back in 2014. Gordetsky was court-ordered to pay $59,000 to Linda Joseph and her son Jeremy Joseph for mismanaging funds he had agreed to invest for them. But according to Rob, they lost money together investing in stocks and betting on sports, something that they had agreed to do. He claims that he never did anything wrong. The court, however, felt differently. Did Rob really make his millions from gambling? No. The simple truth is that he was gambling with someone else's money. What he did instead was the same thing he did to Linda and Jeremy Joseph, except on a much larger scale. Big Rob didn't make any money from gambling gambling. He simply had access to someone else's money. He probably didn't start out trying to scam the people closest to him. He might have genuinely thought he was good enough at gambling or trading. Maybe in high school, he did make a few grand, just not a half a million dollars on trading. And that gave him confidence to think he could do it. And in order to make money in these endeavors, you got to have money in order to make money. So he took on investor money and he had a good enough story to where people trusted him. But instead, when he started trading, when he started betting, he slowly began losing. He got comfortable for a while because he won here and there. That most likely gave him the confidence to win and lose bigger and bigger amounts. However, with big wins also came big losses. And whenever he had the big wins, he celebrated a little. But then a big loss came wiping out the win and not covering whatever money he had spent celebrating the win. And this slowly started spiraling. He was slowly losing and he was running out of money, but he still believed in his abilities. So he took on more money and bet even bigger. And it just got out of control. This is one likely scenario, but he might have just decided to run a giant scam because he could. Did Rob actually know all the celebrities that bet with him? He most likely did meet everyone that he's mentioned, but the rest of the story he most likely just made up. Any sports celebrity who met and took a picture with him had to deal with the unfortunate consequences of Rob showing up in their lives. Rob Gordetsky admitted to stealing Rob roughly $9.6 million between 2014 and 2017 from a person only identified as Victim A. However, it came out later that Victim A was a successful New Jersey ophthalmologist. And he wasn't just a random person. He was the father of Gorodetsky's then-girlfriend. He had made himself out to be a successful day trader to him. They were supposed to share in the profits Gorodetsky would make. Their relationship began in February of 2014 when Victim A gave Rob almost a million dollars to invest in the stock market. Rob, however, took roughly $747,000 of that money and 
just simply spent it on himself. Gordetsky invested only $215,000. To make matters worse, Rob then told victim A in July of 2014 that his investments were paying off. According to Rob, he had already doubled his money to $2 million in the stock market. But in reality, records show that the money Gordetsky had put into an E-Trade account was worth less than $72,000. Rob told his ex-girlfriend's dad that he could make even more money if he agreed to give him more cash. And oh yeah, he also has a talent for sports betting. So he was going to focus more on sports betting. And despite no real evidence for Rob's winning betting method for some reason, he agreed for three more years, Rob would scam him of almost $10 million. He simply just used the money to fund his lavish Vegas lifestyle and his losing bets. Rob would just create fake balance sheets, misstating how much money he had in their account. As far as the dad was concerned, they were making a ton of money. And here's the ironic thing. It was that same USA Today profile that turned out to be Rob's downfall. It got the attention of investigators from the Nevada Gaming Commission and the FBI. If he hadn't decided to do the interview, Rob has a good chance of still running his scams today. Prosecutors also said in court that before he scammed his ex-girlfriend's dad, Rob managed to scam over half a million dollars out of at least eight other investors between 2011 and 2012. He spent roughly $231,000 for personal use and lost the rest on trading. Did Rob actually start off wanting to scam people he knew? Maybe, maybe not. Rob Gordetsky pleaded guilty to two counts of wire fraud and submitting fake tax returns. According to his 2016 tax returns, Rob only made $10,520 that year. Rob was sentenced to 28 months in prison for wire fraud and tax evasion in April of 2021 in order to repay $7.2 million. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comments section what you think is worse, wearing lifts in shoes to be taller or wearing enough makeup to look like a completely different person.